Welcome back. So far, I've been painting a picture of our country from my perspective uh, as a child growing up in the Midwest during the 1930s. In doing so, the world I've portrayed could at times be a somewhat troubled world, uh, one of hard economic times, of apartheid, of isolationism, even outright national socialist sympathies for a while. It was also a thrilling world, a world of baseball, uh, not only the sport we played on lush green fields, which were available plenty during the Depression, uh, but uh, professional baseball, as only radio could portray it, broadcasts that could excite the imagination, the vivid drama of the game, as only a child could envision it. A baseball painted with an indelible brush and vibrant colors that will never fade. But through it all, we were still a nation at peace. Today, war begins, and my childhood abruptly ends. First Sunday in December, double feature time at the local movie theater. For some reason, I hadn't gone to the kids' matinee on Saturday. My folks let me go on Sunday. Now, the problem in Cleveland is that about that time of year, rapidly approaching the shortest day of the year, it gets very cold and very windy and very dark early. So going to the theater at 1.30, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, figure double feature time. Maybe I'd stay for the first one if I'm lucky. It's an action feature, not a romance. And uh, uh, maybe for a short subject or two, and then maybe a, a little bit longer, get out of there before it got dark. Well, I was lucky. Uh, Ten cents, of course, in those days, bunch of the show and a bag of popcorn as well. So I was lucky. Uh, the first uh, show was an action show with something like George Raft and Humphrey Bogart and Jimmy Cagney in it, maybe even Edward G. Robinson, and that was a lot of fun. And then John Nesbitt's Passing Parade, which I loved, and a cartoon or two or something. And then a, then a romance started. It wasn't half that bad. But uh, about 10 minutes into the romance, I remember very vividly that an orange strip came across the screen. And on the orange strip was some black writing. Never seen that before. I didn't know what that was all about. And on the black writing was something I could make out about Pearl Harbor, which I never heard of, uh, attack, big moan from the audience. All of a sudden, people have started leaving. I had no idea why. Pretty soon, I was uh, the only kid left in the theater. I was the only person left in the theater. It's eerie. I was scared. I didn't want to stay there, so I started out. I went out into the cold, and now it was dark. It was snowing. It was a chill wind blowing in off Lake Erie. So I started running home through the snow. Burst into the house, and the scene of my house is a microcosm, gloom and doom. Folks told me we'd been attacked by the Japanese. The Japanese? Why the Japanese? Uh, Bosch had told me all about National Socialism. I was reading already, learning about Hitler. But uh, about that, I knew more than most. And nothing at all about Japan. Nothing. In that, I was uh, not really terribly alone. I'm sure none of my friends did either. What we knew about Japan was sort of simple. We knew about the hardball softballs. You'd get these hardballs, you'd throw them, they were fine. But if they were made in Japan, the first time you hit one out to center field, the flap came off the top, the covering came off the top, and out came this Japanese writing. They were no good after that for anything. So we knew about the hardball softballs. We knew that the word made in Japan, the phrase made in Japan meant cheap. You go down to World Wars Five and Dime, it gets about anything you want, made in Japan. Practically nothing. And we knew also about the uh, postcards, the cherry blossom postcards. Everybody in Cleveland that went to Washington, D.C., suddenly discovered that they had cherry blossoms in Washington, D.C. And they sent home the same postcard. You would get maybe one postcard, or you'd get a ream of postcards like that, all cherry blossoms. That's what we knew about Japan. Not much else. Oh, yeah. There were the war cards. Now, sometimes when you would go down to uh, the rapid stop, try to get baseball card, they were out of them. Well, they try to sell you these war cards. Well, they did it once. 
They came in the same wax paper wrappers. They came in the same awful bubble gum that piled up in the corner of your room. But uh, these were cards were very bloody, very gory. Blood and gore all over the place. Lots of writing on the back. We soon stopped uh, getting those things. Started buying uh, balsa gliders or stuff like that when they were out of baseball cards. Well, uh, I knew that we were on the side of England, but we weren't in a war. I'd even sent a letter to the, the Admiralty. I knew Churchill had taken over in the Admiralty, and I sent a letter telling them we ought to use a hovercraft over the English Channel with magnets to try to pull up the mines. And believe it or not, I actually got an answer from the Admiralty which said something about taking my ideas under advisement. <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. I wish I could dig up that letter. It was wonderful. But I know nothing about uh, Japan. Why us? Well, you know, uh, the pressure was lifting somewhat. War production was on. Uh, we were now furnishing uh, war material to Britain. Roosevelt was uh, dancing around the Neutrality Acts, uh, often risking impeachment. Uh, but why us? Why Japan? I was eventually learned that this story started uh, a long time ago. Seventy years before uh, I attended the theater that Sunday, Seonji Komochi, who was the scion of a noble family in Japan, became the playmate of a young prince. He became the first Meiji emperor of Japan, his playmate did, the young prince. In 1868, time of the Meiji Restoration. In March 1919, Seonji Komochi, now a general, general, G E N R O, means a respected elder in a culture which revered age, headed the Japanese delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, which become known as Versailles. He slipped quietly into an apartment on the Parc Monceau. No one noticed him. Quite a contrast from Woodrow Wilson. Wilson had arrived earlier amidst enormous celebration, great adulation throngs, and parades, and bands at the Champs Elysees. The great uh, emancipator was coming. This was to be the war. It would end all wars. There would be a League of Nations. Komochi would ultimately leave just as quietly as he came, having trumped Wilson and left him in the dust. The fateful results for us, U.S.-Japanese relations, uh, were extraordinary. To me, Versailles was a key turning point, uh, and I will focus on that to uh, a pretty great extent today. Well, let's skip back earlier to a little bit earlier time than uh, the major restoration, 1868. Ten years earlier, Commodore Perry. Commodore Perry slipped into Japan, Japanese harbor, Tokyo Bay, with a fleet of black ships. The idea was to demand that Japan uh, engage in trade with the West. It had been uh, heretofore rather hidden, feudal society, the Tokugawa regime uh, reigned in Japan. They were pretty much immunized from the rest of the world. Uh, the tectonic shifts in the social order that followed were extraordinary. They've been romanticized uh, in uh, Giacomo Puccini's uh, Madame Butterfly, which I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, Syrian drama culture shock, satirized in Gilbert Sullivan's Mikado, probably the uh, most famous of their operettas. Perry had no idea of the forces he would unleash. A culture hidden for centuries is forced now out onto the geopolitical landscape uh, of the Far East. David Andelman, in a marvelous book, which I commend you all, and it's in the syllabus I handed out, called A Shattered Peace, uh, called it a shock to the system, which would all but paralyze the Chinese and energize the Japanese. The word Meiji Restoration really is a euphemism. It was really a revolution, but a, a rather bloodless revolution, relatively bloodless. Reforming nobles would now transform the old Tokugawa regime uh, into a new generation of Japanese into a world power now capable of trading with the West, but capable of a lot else, wresting control of vast regions of, mainland, of the mainland China and of the Pacific. And it would put an end to a policy called the open door, as far as Japan was concerned. This is very important. There is a, it's utterly uh, impossible to understand our relationship 
with Japan that led to the Second World War without understanding the open door policy. Open door was essentially a policy that created of China the phenomenon of the Chinese being guests in their own house. It was an open door to anybody, any European nation that wanted to come into China to um, exercise a sphere of influence. And so you had numbers of spheres of influences like Liu Tong to Russia, Guangzhou to France, Wahi to Britain, and Shantung to Germany became a major factor. Shantung was a, a, a province in, in, in China about 60,000 square miles, full of resources, rich, great seaport. Also, the Dutch uh, colonized Indonesia, Dutch East Indies, the French, of course, uh, Indochina, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. <coughs> Germany had not only Shantung, which became a major, major problem, uh, but the Carolines, the Marshalls, and the Marianas, uh, an island chain which we would uh, learn to our misery later on when they were occupied by Japan, be a major stumbling block to us in our war in the Pacific. And uh, the uh, regime developed Japan's new manifest destiny, new Monroe Doctrine uh, for the Pacific, uh, which would uh, eventuate in another euphemism, the uh, East Asia co-prosperity sphere during the Second World War. So Japan branched out with a new global perspective. And they looked to the West for that perspective. What are they going to model on? Well, they're going to model their navy on Great Britain which had the greatest navy in the world. The sun never set in the British Empire. One quarter of the people in the world, the time they looked out, were under a British control at that time. And uh, result of the British Navy. For army, well, they looked to Prussia, the most powerful armed force, uh, training ground possibly in the world. Now, for the United States, they looked for banking. Of course, that's long before uh, too big to fail. <laughs> but uh, that's where they were. In any event, the policy was uh, likened by Andelman to a shark, which must travel through waters to feed. Feudal islands were turned into a modern military and marketing colossus with mind-boggling efficiency and speed. They expanded exponentially. They uh, became the most feared and despised nation in the Pacific. Many of those feelings have not been dispelled yet. You probably, those of you that have been to the Pacific, into Singapore, in Hong Kong, into uh, Korea, other places in the Pacific realize there's still that tremendous undercurrent of, uh, of hatred for the Japanese, despite all this transpired since. <coughs> they sent their best and brightest abroad. They learned warfare. One of them, by the name of Yuriu uh, Sotokochi, went to Annapolis, graduated from Annapolis, and assisted a brilliant uh, admiral, later Count, Haichichiru Togo, now T-O-G-O, -O, that's not to be confused with Tojo, Hideki Tojo, who eventually uh, took over as Prime Minister of Japan, a militarist. This is Togo, great admiral, great warrior. In 1895, uh, he won the Battle of the Yalu River, defeating the Chinese, the first uh, major uh, action by the Japanese. <coughs> that uh, resulted in the uh, Treaty of Shimonoseki, which is a humiliation for the Chinese, ceded, basically ceded, ceded uh, Korea and Taiwan uh, to Japan. But interestingly enough, what happened there was uh, that that war really began with an attack by uh, Togo on the uh, Chinese fleet while it was an anchor in Taiwan. So I'm reminiscent. Uh, later on, in 1904, uh, the Japanese branched out and for the first time an Asian uh, nation went to war uh, with the European nation. The Russo-Japanese War began at Port Arthur with an attack by the uh, Japanese on the Russian fleet that anchored Port Arthur. Reminiscent? My grandparents uh, both uh, fled the Tsar. They didn't want to go back into the army where they'd already served to get involved in Vladivostok and the Tsar's ridiculous war with the Japanese. That's how it came to be. It came to the United States by bribing the border guards. Well, that uh, war was uh, settled by Teddy Roosevelt, who interjected at that point uh, as a great peacemaker, won the Nobel Peace Prize for it, had settlement negotiations in Portsmouth, signed the treaty aboard a ship called the Mayflower, naval ship. 
And in that, uh, the Tsar was humiliated militarily. Naval uprising resulted. Uh, it was put down. But there was already a weakness that would eventuate, of course, uh, in 1917 uh, in the Bolshevik Revolution. Russia ceded Korea or to Japan, basically, withdrew from Manchuria, uh, and uh, agreed to transfer the southern portion of the Trans-Siberian Railroad uh, to Japan, and the lower half of the Sakhalin Islands, which eventually, incidentally, at the end of the Second World War, when Russia belatedly came in, just before we dropped the bomb, as a quid pro quo, took back uh, the Sakhalin Islands. Uh, but in that uh, peace conference, uh, Teddy Roosevelt angered the Japanese, despite the fact that they'd gotten all of that. Uh, he'd um, stood in their way, rather mammoth reparations that they wanted, monetary reparations that they wanted from Russia. Now for the first time, a suspicion begins to grow in Japan that perhaps the United States may be an obstacle to Japanese expansionism in the Pacific. That's 1904-1905. And now comes World War I. The Japanese role in World War I is a fascinating role. It's an opportunistic role. They looked out over the vast area of the Pacific. They saw that Germany was all wrapped up, both on the eastern front at that time with Russia, before the revolution, and on the western front, of course, with uh, Britain and uh, France. And they said, well, Russia's got this great province of Shantung. They've got these great islands. The Marshalls, the Marianas, the Carolines. You know what we're going to do? We're going to declare it a side of the Allies. No great idealism there. And they did. And they helped. They helped. They sent destroyers and other naval ships into the Mediterranean, which enabled the British uh, to relieve their fleet there before duty elsewhere. They were a significant factor uh, in that war. Chinese were Johnny come lately. They came in very, very end, toward the end of the war. They contributed some coolies to dig trenches in France, but a very different role than Japan. The farther back we look, the farther forward we see, said Winston Churchill. Very, very clear that the very same strategy of attacking islands, attacking possessions, when European powers were weak, happened as well. When there was a blitzkrieg in France, England, and Holland. So we come to Versailles, this critical, critical point in the history of US Japanese relations. Gamochi's team, well, he had a fellow, it was, a very, it was the A team. You know, I, I heard uh, Tiger Woods talk about bringing his A game. This guy brought his A team. He brought Suzette Chenda, who was uh, the ambassador to England. He brought uh, Nabuki Makino, who was the ambassador to France and uh, Britain. Chinda was interesting, interesting product of this reaching out uh, by the Japanese. He was a member, he had gone to the University of Indiana and pledged DKE, the Deke Fraternity. <laughs> Not only that, but he married the sister of a Turney brother. And she wound up planting the second cherry tree along with Helen Taft who was the president's wife, first lady, William Howard Taft. That's how deeply ingrained they had gotten uh, in, into Western civilization. And these two fellows, by the name of Chinda and Makino, were known as the, uh, as the two Makanos uh, in Versailles. Kamochi was a master chess player, a master of the game of diplomacy. Now, Dudley Bonsall, who was a, uh, an aide, uh, to Wilson at the time, and one of the advisors to Colonel House, who was the principal advisor to Wilson in Versailles and elsewhere in foreign policy, uh, was surprised when he met with Komochi. Very few people did meet with Komochi. He was uh, very much hidden. But he met with him. And he was surprised. He came back to Colonel House. He said, look, I just met with this fellow Komochi, and, and uh, he amazed me. So he said, uh, we were talking about Russia and the Constantinople, and now Istanbul. And uh, we were talking about the Russian fleet. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, leave, leave Russian fleet in both. Let them let dominate. Them. By all means, we want them to do that. Amazing. Why? House is very simple. You ever play chess? Yeah. Pick your queen. 
Yeah? Have him protecting the king. Yeah, but you can't move the queen. Because if you do, the king's unprotected. And the rest of your pieces can roam and win. That's exactly what's going on here. They want that Russian fleet tied down. They want them protecting Istanbul. We can then roam in the Pacific. Wise. He had three demands. Kamochi had three demands. The Carolines and the Marshals and the Marianas. He wanted that chain. Same thing they'd taken from Germany, basically occupied when they were in the First World War. He wanted Shantung, that province. And he wanted something else, racial equality plank in the League of Nations platform. Why? Everything we've talked about in Japan so far has been very opportunistic, materialistic. This is a racial equality plank. The sons and daughters of the Golden West uh, out in California had been terribly hostile, and other groups, similar groups, to the Japanese. Japanese immigration here. There were, there were statutes passed, land statutes, all, kind, all kinds of other statutes. There was something called the Yellow Peril. Eventually, all of that resulted, of course, after the attack in Pearl Harbor and the internment of the Nisai in, uh, in California. Anti-Asian legislation, there was even talk of uh, people in Louisiana uh, bringing in Japanese labor, basically uh, in, in Louisiana, uh, like the slave labor before the Civil War. They were proud people. They wanted a plank for racial equality. Australians were passing all kinds of measures to keep the Japanese out. There were five inviting powers to that conference, Japan, Britain, Italy, France, and the United States. That's a pretty powerful company they're keeping. Japan had now moved up into the, into the top group. And at one point, Italy dropped out in a battle over a little place called Fiume uh, on the Dalmatian coast. Uh, believe it or not, the Orlando government practically collapsed over a battle over a little port on the uh, Adriatic coast. So as a result of that, Wilson was now in a situation which is very, very weak. He had really four powers left. He was afraid if Japan dropped out, the whole structure would collapse. China was imposing these demands, of course, and they were represented by a very able fellow named Wellington Koo, graduate of Columbia, excellent debater at Columbia, very articulate, eloquent guy, eloquent, eloquent spokesman for the Chinese. He said to Wilson, the, uh, the Japanese in Shantung were butchers in occupying us. This is a life and death struggle for the Chinese. Wilson realized it, but he was outclassed. He was an idealist, he was a son of a Presbyterian minister. He said, no, the League will protect China. It was a utopian, unrealistic. He was no match. In, in this Machiavellian political arena that became Versailles. Kamoshi played to Wilson's weakness, the desire for the lead. And finally, when all seemed to be ready to collapse completely uh, after Japan was threatening to withdraw, much to Wilson's relief, Kamoshi came up with a compromise. The compromise is, well, we'll keep the islands, Marianas, the Carolines, and the Marshalls, much to the misery of the United States years later in the Second World War. But with regard to Shantung, well, we will eventually withdraw our troops from Shantung, and they did eventually. We want control of the port of Tsonga, the railways, we want control of the mines, other economic banking controls we want, uh, and we will withdraw our, our troops at a future date. And finally, we'll give up uh, this much desired racial equality of plank in the, in the league platform. Wilson accepted it, but he couldn't sleep. He was relieved, but he couldn't sleep. He realized this is a major mistake with regard to China, but he couldn't withdraw. Who told him it's a tragic mistake? His faith in Wilson and the League was misplaced. Wilson had feet of clay. This led to a rally by Chinese students uh, on May 4th, 1919, it became known as the May 4th Movement gave rise eventually to Mao and uh, Chiang and Lai, the rise of the Chinese Communist Party now began. The Republicans called it the Rape of Shantung, arguing in the, in the Senate that we should not join the League, that Wilson had basically compromised China. Wilson uh, was failing in health, went out on, the, uh, out on the hustings to speak in favor of the League, and finally at one point was speaking and uh, became incoherent. His last words, really coherent words at that point, were, I believe, I believe, and he fell into sort of a stupor. At that point on, his presidency was essentially run by his wife and his doctor. 
<coughs> Believe it or not, Kimochi came back to Japan and apologized to the emperor, his friend, playmate. I didn't get you the racial platform, and he was apologetic for that. But he had won an enormous victory. More important even than the victory he has won is this. A major demarcation line had now been passed in the uh, in U.S.-Japanese relations. Because the Japanese now re re realized for sure that the United States was the principal impediment to their hegemony, hegemony in the Pacific. Now, the United States government would be a policy toward Japan, would be governed by something called the Stimson Doctrine. Henry Stimson, Henry L. Stimson was a survivor, amazing diplomat in a way, really stodgy in many ways, a uh, member of the upper crust, basically to the manor born, I served in the administration of William Howard Taft, I served in the Coolidge administration, I served in the Hoover administration, staunch Republican, appointed by FDR in 1940 as Secretary of War in a remarkable, brilliant move where he brought Knox in as a Secretary of the Navy, both Republican, and uh, Stimson uh, to get uh, joined on foreign policy. The Stimson doctrine essentially was this. Protect the open door, but do not recognize uh, any designs on China, any taking territory in, in China by Japan that is not taken without China consent. But essentially, it was intended to maintain sort of that open door situation, other powers. And we were guided by that policy for a long time. Now, back in 1914, the right wing in Japan, then called the Black Dragon Society, had imposed 21 demands on China. China was weak. They wanted the railways, the banks, the mining, Shantung, South Manchuria, Eastern Mongolia, political, financial, and military domination. And China had acceded to a great deal of this. After the uh, Versailles Treaty, uh, we had the 20s. There were a series of naval disarmament conferences starting in 1922 under Harding, going on throughout the 20s, uh, which were really became known as the Washington System in an attempt to limit armaments. Uh, they became more of a state of mind. One of the things that they were bent on doing was integrating China into the economic community of nations. And oddly enough, they were succeeding. It was working. Chiang was beginning to establish a government in Peking after all these shooting warlords and so forth had been dominating China. Or Chiang was beginning to make some inroads, although he was already having major trouble with the communists. But at that time, uh, the Japan right wing realized that they had to react. They had to react, and they had to react before 1931. By 1931, it would be too late to move on China, because things were taking, taking hold uh, too well. They feared the end of J Japanese hegemony in China, and uh, so there followed a series of assassinations. But finally, Prime Minister Hamaguchi, who was an international-minded uh, prime minister, was assassinated. There was a cherry blossom a society, a right-wing society coup, that was spoiled in 1930. Now, the Japanese uh, Kwantung Army, which is a right-wing militarist group stationed in Manchuria, now went out on their own. What they did was they sabotaged the railway yards at Mukden. They used that, almost like the Reichstag fire, as an excuse to, um, to occupy all of Manchuria. And we're talking about Manchuria. We're talking about an area the size of California, Washington, Oregon, and a chunk of Idaho. It's enormous. But they used it as an excuse to invade all of the rest of, uh, of Manchuria and take it over. Immense resources, immense land to be settled. And they, in fact, did settle 250,000 farmers, 500,000 people altogether in Manchuria. What did the world do? Well, the uh, League of Nations made a lot of noise, did nothing. The world did nothing. The framework was collapsing at the League of Nations, just as China was becoming a more self-conscious participant in the League. The puppet regime the Japanese now set up was called Manchu Kuo, installed their own emperor. Passivity of the League, just like the passivity of the League in Europe, as Hitler began his machinations there, very carefully noted by the Japanese. Power, of course, of horrors to vacuum. Japan now ordered total mobilization. They abrogated the Washington Conference of Disarmament Treaties, 
And they entered into something called the anti comintern Pact with uh, Hitler and Mussolini, basically to forestall communism in Russia. In 1936, for the first time, Japan adopted a policy which specifically named the United States, a defense policy which named the United States. 1937, realizing that no one had done anything to really stop them or to stop Hitler in Europe, they invaded China, bombed Shanghai, killed 250,000 civilians. The amphibious forces of Japan out of Formosa, now Taiwan, invaded the mainland and they went up the Yangtze River, got to Nanking, and of course, everyone's heard of the rape of Nanking. Unrestrained troops, the war cards that we used to get at the rapid station, that's what they were showing us, the rape of Nanking. Japanese troops ran amok, uh, raping and pillaging and killing for over six months, totally unrestrained. Chiang Kai-shek abandoned Nanking, which was then the capital, moved all the way up, uh, inland, far away, uh, to uh, Chongqing. The United States gave moral support, but we were bogged down. FDR was bogged down not only with neutrality acts, uh, but uh, also our, our country here was becoming inflexible about getting involved in foreign wars. But uh, FDR was also increasingly focused on the rapidly developing crisis in Europe. He would not, uh, because of the Stimson Doctrine, which he followed adamantly, he would not recognize Manchuria. And the Japanese now, of course, had this major vested interest in Manchuria. 500,000 citizens, 250,000 among farmers, resources, goods coming in. William Bullitt, who was ambassador at the time in the United States, said we had large emotional interests in China, uh, small economic interests, and no vital interest uh, in talking about the Stimson Doctrine. But FDR abrogated our 1911 trade treaty we had with Japan and now began to impose sanctions. Things began to move rather in quid pro quos, moves, measures, countermeasures. David Kennedy, who wrote a marvelous book called Freedom of Fear, it's in the syllabus, I commend that to all of you, Pulitzer Prize winner. He concluded that FDR's failure and inattentiveness to Asia matters were a major, major tragic mistake. A little appeasement would have brought great rewards. But his focus was on Europe. It brings to mind a story about a parochial school cafeteria line where the nuns had put a, um, a sign on a, on a big, bold, beautiful red apples that said, take only one, God is watching. Got to the end of the line, the class joker, it's a big bowl of cookies. The class joker had put another sign on that one, said, take all you want, God's watching the apples. <laughs> Here was FDR. His eye was on Europe. Our eyes were on Europe. Things were happening in the Pacific. He was trying to handle them by a measure, countermeasure kind of thing. Got beyond them. Hideki Tojo began to emerge. Militarist, military family, uh, military hero in Japan, but now he began to get into the government. And a number of governments fell, and a number of assassinations took place the right wing began to move to the top of Japan. Well, FDR bans the export of scrap metal. Tojo now encountered with the tripartite pact with the Hitler and Mussolini. Basically, it was a non-aggression pact. Each pledged that if the other were attacked, they would come to their defense. FDR countered two things. He allowed uh, Claire Chennault and the Flying Tigers sign their commissions, and go to help uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Also began to help the British build the Burma Road uh, in order to relieve uh, Chiang Kai-shek by getting uh, supplies in. And then uh, FDR added copper, brass, pig iron, various other things monthly to the sanctions. Oil was not banned. Oil was a critical, critical factor in Japanese expansion. They were looking for oil. FDR had not banned it, had held it back, because of the entreaties of Cordell Hull, Secretary of State. Cordell Hull was constantly meeting with the Japanese ambassador, trying to negotiate something. FDR was inflexible. Precondition to any the major moves by FDR would have to be withdrawal of Japan from China. Well, of course, Japan's position in China was now so entrenched, was so dependent on it, that wasn't going to happen. It was a non-starter. The only question in Japan now is Tojo really came to the fore. 
uh, during the latter half of the uh, 30s, beginning of 40s, eventually became prime minister in 41, was uh, whether they should concentrate on China or for resources really concentrate in Southeast Asia, go to the Dutch East Indies, British Malaya, French Indochina. That's the only issue that was left. FDR now froze all assets of the Japanese in the United States, intending merely to annoy them. Uh, he wanted them to get bogged down in red tape. He did not want to deny them oil, but wanted to give them some problems getting it. Deny it. Give them some red tape. He left Dean Acheson in charge of that policy when he, Roosevelt, went to South America. Good neighbor policy. Well, Acheson misinterpreted it and basically stopped the Japanese uh, from uh, getting any oil. By the time Roosevelt came back, he realized a major line had been crossed, a major mistake had been made, but the change policy now would be uh, to shift course and lose face. And that you can't do negotiating with an agent like Japan. So in September 1941, Tojo, realizing that war was inevitable, presented guidelines to the emperor, Hirohito. Preconditions for peace, the United States must not aid China. They must have no bases in Thailand, the Dutch East Indies, any place else uh, there, and must restore all trade relations with Japan, no embargoes. Of course, those were non-starters. Japan made a decision they would go south. They would go to the Philippines, the Hong Kong, Malay, Borneo, Dutch East Indies, Guam. They would also cripple U.S. naval power in a, in a fast attack and, and then hope to negotiate from strength from that point on. Did they have designs on taking over the U.S. mainland? No. What they had was the intention to cripple our naval power in the Pacific in such a way that we would come to the bargaining table and allow them to get into those their own open door policy in the Pacific. That, argued Tojo to the emperor, was better than stagnation, strangulation, and subjugation like China. That open door policy was a major factor in the thinking of the Japanese. You've got to understand the Japanese, you've got to go all the way back uh, to the 19th century, and that whole development. The United States broke the code, broke the Japanese code, November. Realized in November the troop transports were already steaming south uh, from Japan. David Kennedy pointed out that under no circumstances can one argue that Roosevelt knew that the Japanese would attack Pearl Harbor. He would not risk the entire United States fleet, said Kennedy, as a casus belli, as a reason for war against the Japanese. But we did know that their fleet was moving south, of course, south of the Philippines. FDR took a last stab, personal message to the emperor on the night before that Sunday matinee at my local movie theater. The last reply to Cordell Hall came through, no further hope of a diplomatic discussion. Seven o'clock Pacific time, 350 attack planes under Commander Mitsuoko Fushida, airborne using saccharin sounds of radio station KGNV on Oahu as a honing device. Japanese simultaneously struck Malaysia, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Wake, and Midway. As they did so, my days as a kid were suddenly about to come to an abrupt end. Japan I'd known, Japan of hardball softballs, cheap merchandise made in Japan, cherry blossoms and postcards, it's now gone. Japanese and the bloody war cards was the Japan I would know for the next four years. Japan of atrocities too great to even contemplate. Darkness will soon descend on the Pacific, just as the darkness of the night soon enveloped my little neighborhood movie house. As I emerged late that snowy Sunday afternoon into a chill wind and a nation at war, as December in Cleveland was rapidly approaching the winter solstice. Thank you.